I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, but in there somewhere and all that is a, a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. Oh, hello, and welcome to the Leaves of Glen Mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion and not just recording in my basement. This is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. This week, we're going to continue we're gonna continue to read The Judgment on Janice by Andre Norton. Yeah, Andre Norton was born Alice Mary Norton. What are you laughing at? And I know I said it weird. I'm so depressed. I'm so sick of reading this thing. <laughs> Don't you laugh at me, you son of a bitch. Andre Norton, born Alice Mary Norton, February 17th, 1912 to March 17th, 2005, was an American writer of science fiction and fantasy who also wrote works of historical and contemporary fiction, uh, and she wrote primarily under the pen name of Andre Norton, uh, but also under Andrew North and Alan Weston. She was the first woman to be the Gandalf Grandmaster of Fantasy and was introduced, uh, inducted uh, by the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame. Uh, burp. Fun facts? Uh, I got none. I think I already read those quite a while ago. Uh, not a lot known about this person who writes a book that is literally dragging me through hell. Uh, so I was going to learn about uh, jerks from uh, grunge.com, authors who are dicks. Charles Dickens who I already don't like. If you've ever read Oliver Twist or David Copperfield, uh, you might get the impression that Charles Dickens was an all-around awesome guy. And in some ways, the Victorian writer was an incredibly caring man. Oh, for 12 years, he ran a home for prostitutes, hoping for a new beginning. And his novels also helped start a conversation about life for children working in factories. But, while well, Dickens was a, a soft spot for orphan kids, he wasn't so concerned about his own children. Oh, oh no. Oh, his oldest son uh, actually once said that the boys and girls in Dickens' book were much more real to him at times than we were. However, while Dickens wasn't a great dad, he might have been the world's worst husband. Dickens had ten children with his wife. Ten children with his wife, Catherine. And eventually, the author got tired of his bride. Yeah, the life of a Victorian woman wasn't easy. And after having so many kids, uh, Catherine was uh, incredibly tired and overweight. So the 45-year-old Dickens started an affair with an 18-year-old actress named Ellen Turnan. Yeah, that's fun. What a nice guy. Dickens had a daughter the same age as his new mistress, Gross, and kept turning, stashed away in various houses where he'd secretly visit her. That's weird. It's likely that they even had a child together who soon died. Jesus. <laughs> Dickens soon decided he didn't want to be with his wife anymore, but instead of just divorcing her, he launched a major smear campaign. Jesus Christ, unfairly attacking her in the press. My God, he published a letter in a newspaper criticizing her mothering skills, <laughs> saying she didn't love her kids and that they didn't love her, which was completely untrue. Even worse, Dickens got a complete or got complete custody of the kids. Fathers always got the children during Victorian times, and he refused to let them see their mom on a regular basis. Jesus, God, this guy's a nightmare. It's kind of shocking to know the same guy who wrote A Christmas Carol could be so cruel, uh, which proves that just because you write awesome books, uh, that's grunge.com, so of course they say awesome books, that it doesn't mean you're not a, a real dick dash ends. Honey, you're not a real dick ends. Get it? Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Ah, Christ, it's still a lot of time for the grandfather clock goes off. Uh, I don't know, I got nothing to talk about in my life except that I'm a teacher's pet. I decided that I don't know what I do with my day at work, so I thought ah, I'm gonna write down every single small little weird time-consuming small request I get at work 
that uh, eats up my day, but I never write it down, I never document it. So I look at the end of my day, I'm like, I didn't get any of my things done, but I was chasing around a lot of crap. So I started writing it down, and then my manager, uh, <clears throat> she was like, yeah, what do you do during your day? So finally, like, I, you know, I've got a list of what I do during my day, and it turns out I'm actually pretty busy. And she goes, oh, can I see it? And I say, yeah. So then she sees it, and she's like, oh, this is great. I need to have all the rest of the people on your team do the exact same thing. So I am a goddamn teacher's pet. Oh, thank God, the grandfather clock. Uh, so with that, why don't we dive into this hell on earth story? Well, here we go. Uh, got yourself all settled here in the library. Remember that bit where I pretend like we go to different rooms? Uh, we're going to read chapter eight and see how bad this... How many, how many pages? One, two, three, four, five. God, they're all five pages, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the text is so small on this printed book that it just means I'm going to be reading for hours. Okay, chapter eight. The Trapped. His hiding place, nigh all speedily discovered, had been carefully chosen by those who had first used it as an observation post. Oh, it gave him a good view of the clearing. The working party that came there now was smaller than those Cosberg had mustered. There were only uh, two slave laborers and three bearded believers. One of those hardly more than a boy. His beard, a few silky straggles on his chin. Then how's he a boy? You don't really start growing a beard till you're like, probably in your t late teens. I don't know. I mean, I knew a couple guys in high school that grew a beard in fifth grade, but... God, those guys were weird. Uh, they began uh, work well away from the brambles that masked the trap, and the Garthmaster kept them busy with a vigor and concentration that suggested uh, he ruled the holding with an iron-rooted will. The labor clearing that was the same Nile had sweated over, but inside him was a new anger coiled and raised. This destruction of what right and good to make more ugly Bareness. Oh, he realized his fingers had curved about the hilt of his leaf-bladed sword, uh, and he was eyeing hotly the leader of that work gang. To remain where he was, he could be the rankest folly, and yet he was held there by that curiosity, the need for knowing that would happen if and when the treasure was found. Oh, oh, would one of those laborers uncover the cash out of sight of his master and seek to conceal part of it for his own? Eh? And Niall was so intent upon watching the workers that he missed the arrival of a second small group at the edge of the clearing, and he was startled eh, to see uh, suddenly the flap the flap of a skirt. His first impression of the woman folk of the believers had been that they had courted dour plainness with the assuity with which off-world women strove to develop the current ideal of beauty. Oh, their sack-like clothing fashion is the same as a dull browns, eh? shabby grays, eh? and sullen uh, black greens. The men also wore carefully concealed any hint of form eh, while their hair was screwed back into tightly netted knots. Oh, it's like uh, 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 Mormons that we saw at Buffalo Wild Wings. My wife and I went to Buffalo Wild Wings. A bunch of Mormons. Did I already say this? I think I probably said this a couple episodes ago. Oh, the guy, they sat down. A bunch of kids looked like they were like 12 years old wearing suits with little nameplates. And they, were, they all sat down all proud of themselves. And there's like nine of them. And then two women wearing weird little prairie outfits with their hair is all in a ball in the back of their head. Oh, they sat down. Oh, man, all the boys just leaned in real close because no matter how close to their version of Jesus they try to get, they can't stop their boners. Uh, away from their own back, uh, our sides had followed the dictates of the rule and were masked a strip of cloth with holes for eyes, nose, and mouth, rendering them both anonymous and safely hideous. Not that they even ventured very far from the buildings of the Garth. In the same time, Niall had been at Cosberg's, and he had never seen any of the women farther afield than the stable yard, except driving, fully masked, and covered with additional muffling cloaks and hoods, uh, to the weekly sky stand of the elect. But here, a woman 
escorted three smaller figures, all masked, baskets on arms. Oh, they were heading toward the, the berry-hung brushes. Ho! Uh, the Garth Master upped his axe for a swing to drop it without delivering the full blow, and he was no giant to match Cosberg, but a thin, uh, active man. And the thrusting forward beard that he developed was fair and lank. All the women stopped and turned to face him, uh, her smaller companions repeating a little beyond her as if cowed by such public uh, notice of their being. Oh, they remained so while the Garth Master climbed a fallen tree, uh, trunk, and then came to the... Uh, oh, oh, what do you do here, girl? He demanded. One work-reddened hand gestured at the heavy harvest of berries. Ah, oh, these will be uprooted soon. Her voice was low, without expression. And there is no need to waste this present crop. The Garth Master uh, considered that point and approached the berry bushes closer as if to estimate the value of their wild uh, abundance. Then he nodded. Eh, <laughs> Sorry, I had a hamburger tonight, so now I'm spitting out hamburger pieces. Uh, keep to your work, girl, he ordered. And make haste. We want to clear here before night. The children scuttled to the pickies as he strode away, but for a moment the woman stood where she was, her head now turned to the forest, her eyes, Niall thought, not on berries at all, but on the woodland behind them. And when he saw her do an odd thing, put, uh, put out her hand and draw one finger down the graceful bend of the stem from which hung a cluster of small white flowers. Oh, oh, her, her head turned sharply right, uh, and then laughed. And then she bent to smell that flowering spray before she went on to strip the berries into her basket in quick, efficient motions. Whether by chance or design, she pushed her away, picking as she went until the patch of bramble was a screen between her and the other working party. Then, having added a last handful of fruit uh, to her basket, she set it carefully on the ground and straightened uh, to her full height, uh, once again facing the depths of the forest. Her hands went to the back of her hood, <clears throat> fumbled with the cords, and then she jerked off her mask with an impatient gesture. All her head was up, her chin raised with a, a movement into which Niall read defiance. She had the pallid skin of all Garthside women, and her features held no hint of beauty, but, oh, she was young, no more than a girl, and a high-bridged nose centered above a... Uh, a small mouth with, with with one thin, pale pink lip. Oh, her, her eyes were all uh, well set. Her eyes were well set. That's a weird compliment. Now they're in the right spot. But above them, there were thick brushes of brows, giving them a, a harsh and forbidding half frame. No, she was not even remotely pretty <laughs> by off-world standards. What? She's got good set eyes. And that the alien, which was within Niall, now found her pale skin repulsively... Ugly. Raising her hands, raising her hideous hands, she pressed her palms against her cheeks in a gesture that he could not understand. And then, as if some pull beyond control moved her, uh, she walked forward, her clumsy skirts catching and holding on the branches uh, on to, to the shadow of the trees. Once well hidden by their overhanging branches, she paused once more, standing very still. Oh, her head was raised. She did not appear to be looking, only waiting eh, and listening for what Niall could not guess. Timidly, comma, shyly, comma, her hand came up again to pluck a spray of flowers. She cupped the blossoms in her fingers, bending her head as if she studied some treasure. And with a glance over her shoulder, furtive and guilty, she tucked the flowered stem into the front of her robe. Oh, her head up again. Her eyes sought now along the green silver curtain of the woods. Uh, Ash, Ashla? Her name's Ashla? That's probably the most normal name I've heard so far in this book. It's close to a normal name. Ashla, question mark. The girl's whole body jerked and answered the call, and her hand went swiftly to the flowers and pulled them loose, and then threw them away in what was a single motion of repudiation. Then she was busy adjusting her mask, in which she turned to face the child that covering was safely in place. Oh, she beckoned the little girl to her and looked into the other's basket. Ah, you done well, Samira. 
Wow, we've actually got some mildly normal-sounding names for a change, two of them in a row. She approved with a warmth in her tone that had been lacking when she answered the Garth Master. Tell Isla, Il- Ilsa, uh, it's already going down the tubes. Tell Ilsa and Arma that you may uh, all eat a handful yourselves. Oh, the child's man's face was raised. Is it allowed? Eh? She asked doubtfully. Uh, it's allowed, Samira, and I shall answer for it. When the child left, Ashla went back to her picking, moving closer to the laden branch that dipped above the trap. Niall's eyes smarted. Oh, the sun broke through here and there, dazzling, too dazzling for his altered sight, yet uh, he must witness what must happen now. Uh, would she find it? Uh, or would she? Uh, would the, the cash be left for the discovery of the laborer who came to the grubs of the brush? Oh, the bramble moved closer to her as she tugged and it stripped berries and double handfuls, and then her hands gave a harder tug, bringing up all the long branch. As she stood very still, masked face bent groundward, her head turned. Her, uh, she glanced in the direction of the children, uh, but they were half hidden. Their dull dresses only patches between the bushes, and she stooped and caught up a dead branch and dug into the earth with short, quick jabs. Green fire flashed in so bright a spark that Niall winced hand to eyes. And when he was able to see her again, she was holding the necklace before her. Again, People are just finding jewelry in the forest that turns you into aliens. I, I hope this author has a very good reason why this is happening. No expression could be read behind the enveloping mask, but she had made no sound, given no call to summon uh, to the men. Instead, she spread out the necklace so that the lace of gem drops hung smoothly in graduated rows. Niall, uh, who had been given that part of the treasure, only passing attention before it could not observe and appreciate its full beauty. And if the jewels were real, that Garth girl now held the kingdom's ransom, such a necklace uh, as an empress would wear to her crowning. And uh, he had no reason to believe that they were not stones of a price. Almost as if she had no control over her own desires, Ashla drew the lovely thing to her so those uh, connected rivers of rich green fire now lay on the sacking stuff of her rope, making the coarse material twice as ugly in contrast. Maybe she thought that too, for the quickly she held the stones away again. Then, to Niall's surprise, she bowed the necklace and wrapped it in a big leaf cuffed from a nearby plant, tying it to the paquette with a twist of grass. One more glance at the uh, the children to make sure of their continued intention. And she pulled the skirts free from the clutch of the bushes to walk into the woods. A sandaled foot came out from under her voluminous clothing as she dug with the heel and toe in the leaf mold and dropped in her prize. And then she pulled a stone over the hiding place. So it was speedily and deftly done that Niall might have been witnessing an action performed many times before. Ashla uh, gave a last searching inspection, then hurried back to her bramble uh, with her digging branch that she recovered the rest of the treasure, and she was uh, stripping the remainder of the berries when the children came straggling by with their own baskets. Ashla, the call came from the Garth Master, and one of the children caught at the girl's skirt. Oh, she nodded a brisk reassurance that in that direction it started out in the glade, and the children in her wake burped, heading toward the open fields. So, uh, even uh, the believers were not immune ah, ah, to the temptations of the treasure traps! Exclamation point! Niall remembered the story of the girl at Cosberg's who had kept running away to the forest until this uh, green sick put an end to her, quote, sitting, unquote, forever. Had she also secreted some uh, part of the treasure? Eh, kept it hidden as she tried to do this, and Ashley was attempting. Oh, the ring of axes, the loud voices of the workers marked a change of direction. They would soon reach the bramble patch too near his own lurking place. They must slip farther back into the wood. Niall found shelter. Where the ring of axes was only a very distant sound, and slept out the rest of the day, rousting after dusk to find a stream. Eh, and, and drink! He still had a supply of bread from Ifsigas. God damn it, I forgot about this name. Ifs, Ifsiga, Ifsigas. Supplies. And he ate that slowly, favoring, uh, savoring its flavor. And there was no moon tonight. Oh, the wind was soft. Mm. Moisture laden. Eh? Rain coming soon. 
Four dots. It might be wise to hole up again, wait out any storm. Yet he wanted to know. Dash. He had the cash, had been discovered by those in the clearing. And would they have a guard there now, or would their fear of the forest by night be a deterrent enough? Niall approached the clearing of the stalker's caution, testing the air with his nose, yeah, and listening to every sound as well as, as using as using his his eyes. The stone Ashla had left to mark the necklace was undisturbed, but beyond, the brambles had been grubbed away, and dot, 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 he caught the enemy scent. Luckily, the wind blew in his direction, and not away. Ready for trouble, he dodged back to the forest, and an instant later, he heard the coughing bay of a hound, followed by the excited shouts from at least uh, uh, two men. A guard, right enough, reinforced by one of the watchdogs, but Niall did not believe that they would dare to track him far. Their superstitious fear of the th- uh, the thickly treed lands would be doubled at night, and he was certain that they had not actually sighted him. And he was certain that they had not actually sighted uh, that the settlers, and uh, Cosbergs at least, had been active in populating the inner woods and the unseen enemies. The hound's uproar might have been attributed to the prowling of an animal. No hunt would draw them this far. But guards at the clearing meant that the cache had been discovered. That tomorrow or the next day or the next, whatever the guard master could summon, a speaker, sinful objects would be ceremoniously destroyed and the, quote, sin of the whole small community purged by fasting and ritual. Oh, it'd be, a, it'd be best to lie low until that was over. Yet, he had to know if, the, if his guess concerning the treasure trap was correct. Would Ashla... Follow the, pl- the pattern, fall victim to the green sick, and be exiled as a, a contamination, finally becoming what he was? Oh, you must know, exclamation point. Why, question mark, who, eh, question mark. The question still rode him. But more important, uh, what was he to do now? Return to if can, to wait, or dot, dot, dot. In that moment, Niall learned that he should never forget the forest was not all friend. Oh, he plunged forward in a sprawl in the same instant that his nose was assaulted by the most stupefying uh, carnal reek. Rolling, kicking, unable to free his uh, right foot from a loop of dark uh, ropey stuff, he hung at last, uh, head down and feet up against the, uh, the wall of a pit and the stench from which turned him sick. Oh, God damn it. Crawl, crawl, crock! Exclamation point. I R memory. I oh A R memory. I gotta hate this. A R memory identified the enemy, the method of its attack. Niall twisted, trying to bring up his head and shoulders. The sword now free in his hand, and he gained purchase of his elbow against the wall, enough to wrench his shoulders partly around. Oh, but he had he had only a second to bring about the sword point before the phosphorescent bulk on the other side of the hole moved. Oh, the, the thing came in a flying leap against uh, and, uh, meant to plaster it against the earth uh, of the wall and with the dangling body of its prey flattened under it. Uh, the very force of that spring brought his belly down upon his sword nigh out of hell. Oh, he, he cried out as claws scissored at his legs, and the terrible odor of that body, the, disgu- the disgusting weight of its mass struck against him. Then, as he hung gasping and choking, there came a thin screech, uh, so high in the scale that the sound was uh, to cause a sharp pain in his head. And the call crock fell away, kicking and scrambling in the noisome depths of its trap, taking his sword, and still in the deep belly wound with it. Niall, very close to unconsciousness, dangled head down once more. Then A.R. memory, I hate this, prodded him to weak effort. To hang so was to die, even if the cow crock had also suffered a death blow. He must, uh, he must try to move. Oh, there's a bleeding rake across one arm. His legs were torn, too, uh, but he must get free. He must, exclamation point. He twisted and turned and rubbing his body against the wall. Perhaps the force of the cow crock spring had already weakened the web cord that held him or perhaps his own feeble efforts fretted it against the rough wall. But it gave, uh, but it gave, and he slid down to the debris of the pit bottom. The gleaming lump uh, that was the terror of the trap lay on his back. It clawed his uh, legs uh, still jerking, the sword hilt projecting from his underparts. Niall wretched. Somehow got to his feet and stumbled over to drag his defiled blade free. Uh, he ran it into the soil of the pit wall to clean it and then looked about him, half dazed. 
to climb these walls was, he believed, close to impossible. Oh, they had been most skillfully fashioned to prevent the escape of trap of cow crocs. Cow crocs at back doors. They did not depend altogether on their pit traps to supply, uh, to supply their food needs. God, this chapter won't fucking end. How many pages? Oh, God, only one more page left. Only such an exit would lead past the cow crocs nest and past any nestings such as a shelter might contain IR uh, memory. Was I hate that it's called IR memory now. Was clear enough to make Niall shudder. Move now, at once, before there was any stir there. Three dots. And if there is any to stir, exclamation point, he edged around the confines of the hole, supporting himself with a hand against the wall. The pain of his leg wounds was beginning to bite now. He must go before these wounds could stiffen and keep him from moving it, moving it all. And this was it, a hole in the blackness, uh, from which issued a fetid odor to make him sick again, forcing down his fear and repulsion. Niall went to his hands and knees, his sword ready, and crawled into that passage. Uh, it's French for passage. Uh, the walls were slick with slime, uh, well polished by the Calcroc's constant use. Oh, this was an old, well established den. Uh, all the more reason to fear the nest! Exclamation point. And uh, there was a dark, it's such a, so fucking boring. And <laughs> there was a dark, was so, that his night sight, good as it was, could not help him. Scent? Question mark. How could one separate any evil odor from the general stench of the devil run? Hearing, he must depend now upon his ears for any warning, and to do that, he must go slowly. So he crept onward, sweeping the sword back and forth ahead to ensure himself that there was no opening on the other side of the run, pausing to listen, a scrape of leg against earth, the moving of a body... Yeah, would he be able to recognize for that for what it was? The warnings of a nearby and occupied nest. I'm reading this out loud, but I'm not paying attention when I'm reading anymore. This is getting really boring. Sword point met nothingness at his left. Don't care. Niall stiffened, listening. Did, don't care. Nothing. Nothing at all. Where are the infant monsters alert, waiting to make the pounce? Or were there any nestlings now? Eh? Niall dared not linger too long. It was the hardest test he had ever placed upon his courage and will. Uh, that slow forward creep. His only defense against attack. The sword. He kept point out, aimed at the opening he could not see, behind which lay death. Not sudden. Eh? Oh, but very terrible. The sword point bit at the wall again, and he had reached the other side of that opening. Now, dash, now he must go forward with his back to that, never knowing when attack might come. This was an endless nightmare, which had, uh, he, as, as he had once awakened from the past, shaking wet with terror sweat. On, dash, on, dash, no sounds, dot, 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 no, comma, no sounds from behind, period. An empty nest, but he still could not be sure of that, or count on such fortune. Relief could make one careless, uh, but be ready, uh, listen, dash, creep, dash, through, though now he could turn to fight in this narrow passage. Niall did not know. Then, abruptly, the surface under him angled sharply upward, and he drew a, a, a breath deeper than a gasp. This, this was the exit. Up, up, uh, dash, up, and out. And he dug the sword into the earth and used it to lever himself out. That's three dots. Uh, to be met with rain full in his face, cold and slashing on his body. And not too far away, he heard the torrent of the river. The river. And beyond, <laughs> colon, ift can, exclamation point. Did I.R. take over holy then? Niall afterward thought so. It was as if he had been uh, when the fever held him. Small, broken snatches of dream action wrapping around him. Oh, or are they real? Those times when he clung to the river-washed rocks while a swollen stream rose about him, when he staggered on through gusts of beating rain and with lightning flashes showing, uh, showering him and uh, showing him the... the towering dread of the, of the tree city. Ah, oh, there was a one crash of thunder. A, a blast of lightning bolt. Uh, so great, so dazzling, that together they blacked out the world. And from then on, he had no memories at all. Trees! Uh, ifstigia! 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 
exclamation point. He lay uh, looking upon the night of the ancient citadel, its silver green crown so far above him that the leaves were only a haze of color against the sky, as high as the stars almost. Uh, the Larsh! Uh, Niall sat up, reaching out for his sword, looking about him for some sort of sign of the enemy. Oh, his body uh, hurt, uh, battle wounds. He had survived. Then the overrun at the second ring. Uh, Jagna! Exclamation point. My, Midar! Midar! Exclamation point. His call <laughs> issued from the lips of a weak whisper. A fucking hate all these fake names. A swish of displaced air overhead, and he held his sword ready. Wide white wings. Oh, it's gonna be that owl friend which clasped his body. Was his owl's friend named Hu- Huar? Huda- Hodar? Uh, wide white wings which clasped his body as talons touched the earth, and a quirin came to him. A pouch dangling from its beak. It is! It's Huar! H-O-O-R-U-R-R. Uh, Niall loosened his grip on the weapon hilt. Uh, once more, he blinked awake from a dream I.R. had known. Who were? The bird dropped the pouch in his hand and snapped, chittered a reply, and the corn walked slowly down the length of the man's body, as if inspecting his clotted wounds. And Niall was back in the safety of Ifkan, uh, though he could not remember anything since he had uh, crawled out of the crowcock's den. Oh, thank God that's done. Uh, with that, why don't we... Take a little break where we can uh, just relax for a goddamn minute and go upstairs to the, uh, the wonderful sensual uh, bedroom where I could read to you the latest uh, in romance literature from Penguin Random House Books. Oh, look at you. You're dressed like some kind of serving wench. I love the cleavage. That's fantastic. Finally, you've dressed in a way that pleases me, and you please me. Oh, you're gesturing towards a book on my on my beautiful silken waterbed. Uh, the book's called Well Traveled by Jen DeLuca. Well, I can't wait to see what this is. Based on your costume, I'm sure this is going to be a ama- Oh. Why'd you just say the word thusly? That's a little embarrassing. You seem like you're too happy to be acting that out. You just said yay verily? Ah, oh, Christ. Now you're making my skin crawl. All right, fine. Let's just read about this. In Indy, the uh, next pick uh, is what they say about well-traveled. The Renaissance Fair, oh, I see what you're doing, is on the move, and Lulu and Dex are along for the ride. In this, in the next utterly charming rom-com from Jen DeLuca, oh, a high-powered attorney from a success-oriented family, Louisa, quote, Lulu Malone, uh, lives to work, and everything seems to be going right, until the day she realizes it's all wrong. Lulu's cousin, Mitch, introduced her to the world of Renaissance fairs. <laughs> and when she spies one at the time, just when she needs an escape, she leaps into... I love that it's being set up like some sort of, like, subculture, or some kind of cult kind of thing, like, oh, he's joining a group of Satanists. As she leaps into the welcoming uh, environment of turkey legs... Uh, taverns and tarot readers. The only drawback? Oh, could there be one? Dex McLean, a guitarist with a killer smile, <laughs> the Casanova of the fair, and her traveling companion for the summer. Dex has never had to work for much in his life, and why should he? Touring with his brothers as the dueling kilts uh, is going great, and he always finds a woman at every fair. Oh, yeah, he does. And then when, and when Lulu proves indifferent to his many plaid charms and a shake-up threatens the fate of the band, Dex must confront something he never had before. His future. All forced to spend the days and nights together on the road, Lulu's interest in the kilted bad boy grows as he shows her side of himself that no one has seen. The stresses of her old lifestyle faded away as she learns to trust her intuition and follow her heart. <clears throat> instead, instead of her head. But when her time on the road is over, will Lulu go with her gut? Or she and Dex desired for separate paths. Well, that sounds boring as hell. Uh, you can find that uh, on December 6th. Oh, that's a nice little date, which is also available on Amazon, Barnes Noble, Books A Million, Bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, Indiebound, Powell's uh, Target, and Walmart. Well, with that, uh, 
I'm not horny anymore. I liked your outfit, but the way you're acting, you're just too into it. You're, you're too into role-playing this thing, and so now you're making my skin crawl, and I'm kind of embarrassed watching you. So with that, uh, why don't we just go back downstairs and finish reading the rest of this story? Ah, there you go. You're all settled. Uh, just to let you know, I am so sick of this book and it's so painful to read that I have broken uh, this show into two halves. So I am now doing this part the next day to try and have uh, uh, just a break. So now we're going to read chapter nine it's titled Monster, the Storm. That had raged in the forest as nigh all one free from the crow cockpit. Jesus Christ. You know, taking time just makes me have even less tolerance for these names. Did not quickly blow itself out. His wounds tended with the same salve that he had used on horror's seared wing. He managed to climb into Ifschiga and lay there on the mats of the living wood of the chamber walls about him, throbbed and sang with the fury of the gale. Once there was a crash heavier than the roll of thunder, and the whole of Ischigia quivered in sympathy until Niall feared that an earthquake shock had threatened the rooting of the citadel. He guessed that one of the long-dead tree towers had been struck by lightning and wind-toppled. Now, there's no way to mark the passing time. Uh, no period of sun alternating with the welcome cool of night. Horror shifted from chamber to chamber, closing his wings to clamber down or, or up through the ladder hole, visiting Niall or withdrawing restlessly again. And Quarin was unhappy, resenting the in in imprisonment forced upon him by the storm. Uh, then Niall awoke to silence. Uh, aware, as he tentatively stretched his legs, uh, that the healing wounds uh, so uh, no longer smarted, no, and that he could move with a measure of comfort, and the pound of the wind was stilled, the tree silent and no longer pressed or battered. He replaced his torn and soiled clothing with the fresh from the stores and, and swung up out of the entrance branch and looked out over the forest into the fading, pale, water sunlight. The storm had indeed wrought changes. Those trees that had shown bone gray among the shorter green of the new growth had been shattered. Smoke curled from charred and smoldering uh, trunks. Uh, to the west there was that wasteland of evil stretched, and there was a drifting murk as if fire burned thereabouts. Uh, from this perch, Niall could see across the river, burp through the storm-torn gaps of foliage. There was a new chill in the air, and he had landed on Janus. How many weeks ago? And now, as he tried to count that tale of planet-spent days, first in his head, uh, and then childishly uh, on his fingers, he found too many discrepancies, but he had been brought to Cosberg's in late uh, midsummer, and the days are now chilling eh, in the fall season. And then he knew from what he had heard at the Garth that the, the, when the winter gripped this land, it could uh, be sear and bitter. Seer, S-E-R-E, -E, and bitter. All right, whatever. I don't, it's not a Kindle, so I can't look it up. Yet, I are memories again. Oh, God damn it. And there had been uh, other winters long ago when men had not been bound to shelter against storm blasts and leaves lingered. If more heavily severed, uh, silvered, until new opening buds uh, pushed them free in the spring, but that had been before the death of Iftkan. Now the guards must be preparing for the cold season, but this past gale had brought with it the first whispers of the autumn change. Niall was glad for the cloak about him when the wind reached exploring fingers to the branch on which he sat. Winter, the leaves gone, the forest mm, naked. Then, if there was a hunt, uh, any fugitive would have far less of a chance. Had it been approaching winter that had sent the strangers from Ifcan to the sea. He bit on that, yeah, savored what it might mean as he might bite doubtfully on a newly discovered fruit uh, to find it uh, sour. One could remain here at Ifsiga, uh, Ifsi Ifsiga, but the winter was the season in which the Garths burned off the fringe. Fire, so said, was never controlled as far as the spreading of the forest was concerned. The farther the Flames ate into the woodlands, the better the settlers liked it. 
and the dead trees about here would make one great torch of the whole dead city. Somewhere to the west, near the sea, dot, 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 Niall considered uh, that move thoughtfully, and uh, in so going west, he could swing by the front, uh, frontier garth and see what had happened there to Ashla. Tonight, no, perhaps a day's more rest, and then his wounds less sore, and he could move fast and quietly. That night, he hunted with horror, the bird dropping noiselessly to buffet a borfund with a beating wings and uh, slashing talons till Niall's sword brought an end to the bewildered animal's life. The man kindled a small fire among stones, toasted lean, flavorsome meat over the flames of the sharpened sticks, and he found the taste good after his long diet of bread from the stranger's stores and berries and, and seed pods of the forest. Ah, this has been done many times. I, our memory told him. This was the old free life of if 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 kin kind. Oh, for fuck's sake. The third night after the end of the storm, Niall sorted carefully through the supplies of the tree chamber and made up a, a journey pack, which must serve him if he did not or you know, could not return to the period that might run into weeks. Another change of clothing, including skin boots, eh, the bread stuff, a pouch of healing ointment, a knife he found, a knife he found. During that search for supplies, he opened and investigated every box and chest in the upper chamber, but he did not touch those of treasure room below. <laughs> there was a reluctance in him now to have anything to do with those objects, although he could believe the settler's conviction that danger clung to the caches, and that he had no desire to test the theory further as he stood at the foot of Isagar. Uh, before setting out, Niall was struck by a sudden feeling of peril, uh, uh, so intense, only determined effort of uh, will to set him moving. As he went, horror, horror, winged down the forest aisle over his head, uttering a querulous, complaining cry. Uh, from Quarren to man, a disordered message sped. Danger. Niall paused, alert, looking up uh, to the bird, now perched overhead. Where? Uh, his lips shaped the same word in his mind formed. But the concept that answered him was too fragmentary, too alien to provide any real answer, only that the danger was not immediate, only that it was old. Old, maybe as if can itself. Yeah, uh, uh, fire? Yeah. <laughs> Settlers? Niall pushed his demand of knowledge. Uh, neither. No, this was something else. Then he got an answer that was sharper and clearer. From the west came the threat. Out of the splotch of the waste, keep away. Well, out of that way, old ills dwelt there. What might spread again, were they uh, to be awake? Awake? How? What? Uh, but horror provided no understandable reply. All right, Niall agreed. I go this way. And he tried to mind picture a southern road back along the road. Mind picture? <laughs> along the river, the garth where he had seen Ashla. Horrors! Orb eyes regarded him measuringly. Now, there was no thick, uh, flicker of thought from the bird. Uh, he might be considering Niall's reply, turning it over in his mind to compare with the conclusion of his own. Uh, do you go too? Niall asked. Uh, to have keen-eyed winged hunter with him would mean doubled. Uh, security, but he had no doubt that Corrin's senses were far keener than his own. Horrors, feathers, tufted, head turned and, and on round shoulders. The Corrin faced west, and that west against which he had just warned. Now his wings mantled as if he were about to launch at some prey or, uh, or some uh, enemy, and he hissed, uh, not cried aloud, uh, that hiss was filled with Cold venom and rage, uh, that he was uh, a figure of pure defiance. Oh, for it was defiance, exclamation point. Horror was posturing against something to be feared. Again, Niall tried desperately to reach Corrin's mind to learn, uh, to share, and what information was locked in that feather-topped skull. <laughs> With his wings folded neatly against his body again, talons scraped along the branch as horror sidled to a point directly above Niall's head. Ah, the cord gave a voice once more, this time with no hiss, but a clacking of beak. The man had come to learn was a signal of ascent. They found the river high, the rocks necklaced with foam. Debris loosened by the storm rafted down in the current. Oh, to horror, the crossing was no problem. Ah, he flapped over to a tree on the opposite bank, and Niall moved along to the shore, studying the lie of the rocks and calculating the possibility of using them as stepping stones. 
Once there had been a bridge there, its arches, uh, long since tumbled and riven apart by numerous floods, perhaps uh, only I, our memory, uh, could have moved Niall's eyes now to pick up those points, align them, and see which way they take. Oh, a chauncey path with the rocks wet and water a wash, uh, at least two, settling his pack to balance evenly, he took a running leap. Somehow he made it, though he was shaking with more than a chill of water spray when he reached the far bank and sank to his knees a little weak and a great deal amazed at the success of his efforts, period. On the side of that river, the storm rock was evident, and not having horror's advantage, Niall had to make wide detours to avoid the tangles where the trees, uh, not as huge as those of Ift can, but large enough to uh, amaze off-worlders, had gone down. God, this sentence won't fucking end. There's no period there. Uh, had gone down, that's a comma, had taken their lesser brethren with them. Oh, there's the period. There was a wide path of such wreckage, uh, cutting across the shortest route of the garth. The hour was past dawn, before Niall worked his way uh, through that to take shelter for the day. When did he become conscious of that thin, wailing plaint? The sun was no longer watery. Oh, its rays beaten to the opening left by the storm's wind's fury. Prisoning him in a half cave beneath upturned roots, and the sounds of the daytime dwellers of the woods were all about him. Small creatures eh, had come into the new open space to root about in the disturbed soil. But this sound, dot, 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 Niall lay with his head on the pack listing, giving it the same attention that he had afforded horror's warning. No, no, this was no animal cry. No, no bird call. Yeah, low, continuous, wearing on the ears. Uh, and coming from some eh, distance. How long before he was able to associate that with his mind? With the pain, some creature tapped into the snarl of wing-tossed wood, pinned between trunk and earth, or mangled and left to suffer? Question mark. Niall sat up, hunched together, his head turning southward as hearing traced that sound. Sometimes it sank until he was scarcely audible. Again, its kneeling wail rose, broke, until he was sure that he could almost distinguish words. A lost settler? Yeah. Niall crawled to the outer opening of the burrow and tried to shade his eyes well enough to see through the shattering brightness of the sun. Oh, but he could just make out a mass of green several uh, hundred yards away that the destructive path of the whirlwind had spared rather than flattened. From there, dots, or from beyond... Out in the open, he would be as good as blind, but if he could work his way to that other strip of uh, standing wood, he might be able to make some progress. And the call, if call it was, pulled him, uh, would not let him settle back into his hole. Niall pursed his lips, imitated horror's hoot, as he had learned to do in the summers, and answering beak snap came from where the quern roosted in the upturned root mass over Niall's head. Uh, see what calls. See dash what dash calls. What the hell? The man thought that out, aimed the order at the bird. See what calls. Horror, well, snapped angrily, protesting. Uh, he gave a hop to the next tree trunk and walked along it. His gray-white feathers made a blinding dazzle in the sun as he took off with a flap of the wings. And Quarren preferred that night, and he would move better than Niall by day. Well, Niall tried to mark the shortest distance across that open space to the trees beyond and always came to that crying. He shouldered his pack and moved out, squinting as he tried to avoid pitfalls underfoot. Oh, God, this is so annoying. With the twist of his ankle and the wretched half-healed wound of the cow croc and dealt with him and left it limping and he made it across the open, that crying, it did hold words slurred together, undistinguishable with the words when it came to the point could not be too far from the Garth Fields. <gasps> what had happened? Oh, he had been holding the swept of one of the devastating winds and the people driven into the forest. Uh, alone, dot, 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 alone one night, not right. Horus' message came up ahead and went alone that night, right, but the puzzle of hurt, trap, and I all plunged on you. God, just get there and find out what it is. I don't care. That broken and forsaken, but Cosberg had shown the newcomers a warning, the moldering ruins shunned by everyone of the Garth, and there's another such hardly other any more to lean to in the brush, and the horror approached the highest point of the flimsy roof. Niall made a second rush across the open. He's still trying to get across, and stooped to the enter, uh, enter the place. The voice had fallen to the muttering, and he smelled the fetid odor of sickness, and the foot struck against the earth and water jar, which rolled away empty. Uh, she had no mask, no hood now, and her sack robe was torn so that uh, she restlessly moving her hands with her arms were bare. The pallid skin was splotched with great blotches of green and masses of loose... Oh, he's got a girlfriend now. Loose hair had fallen away with the ever-turning head. Oh, her eyes were open. Eh? 
fixed on the brush of the roof covering, but they did not see that or anything about her. Niall judged. Oh, he slipped his arm under her, raising her rolling head, studying it against his own shoulder while he moistened, moistened her cracked lips from the water bottle he had just filled in the river. Oh, she, oh, she, God, she licked her lips and she made a faint sucking sound <laughs> so that he let her drink more. <laughs> oh, oh, she made a sucking sound, so he gave her more. Under his touch, her skin was fire hot, and she was plainly deep in the fever of a green sick. He settled her down once more and looked about the hut. <clears throat> the girl lay at a pile of torn and earth-stained bags, which must have been used uh, for the storing of grain earlier. A plate was by the door and some crusts on it and a mass of bruised fruit over which insects now crawled. Niall sent that spinning about with a grim ejaculation. Oh, an ejaculation. Oh, food, water, a bed of sorts. Uh, what, what more could a sinner hope for? Yeah, this is getting nice. In spite of the challenges of the sick this, he knew her for Ashla, and Ashla must be proven sinner by the rules of her own people. Niall's expression was a half-snarl as he glanced momentarily in the direction of the Garth, from which she must have been expelled as soon as they recognized the illness that had struck her down. But he had survived, and he suspected, and so, uh, and so had others, perhaps many of them. There was no reason to believe that it would be different for Ashla. Niall helped her drink for the second time, and then wiped her face and hands with moistened grass. Oh, she sighed. Green, green fire. At first he thought she spoke of her illness, remembering his own delirium. Then Niall saw her hands were spanning apart, and he recalled how she had stood that day holding the beauty of the alien necklace before her in just the same fashion. Cool green ift can. Oh, he caught those words eagerly. Ift can, exclamation point. Did Ashley deep in the clutch of the fever now also house a changeling memory? Yeah, it's your it's your new girlfriend. And, uh, oh God, I hope there's a laborious scene involving sex somewhere in this book. We're not even halfway through this goddamn thing. And I had never been a part of the Garth, but her own settler history. On impulse, Niall took her two hot hands into his, holding them tightly against the small attempts to pull free. If can, he repeated softly, in the forest, cool forest. If can stands in the forest. The restless turning of Ashla's head slowed. Her eyes were closed, and suddenly, from beneath those lids, tears gathered made silken tracks down her sunken splotched cheeks. If Ken is dead, her, fur, her voice was firmer, held to an authority that, uh, well, that surprised him. Oh, it's not, not at all, he assured her softly. If Ken stands, oh, if Shiga stands, living still. Cool, green, ah, the forest lives. Think of it, uh, think of the forest, Ashla. Frowned lines appeared on her closed eyes, and the heavy brows that had given her face harshness were gone now, but uh, uh, as was most of her hair. Oh, alopecia totalis. I just learned that from watching a horror film with my wife, <laughs> where people got a disease where they would go bald, and the doctor goes, ah, is it alopecia? Alopecia totalis. Alopecia totalis? <laughs> Science. I get to use it in my podcast. Well, now her hands tightened on his rather than trying to pull free the forest. But I am not Ashla. Again, that note of firmness of decision. I am, oh, for fuck's sake, another fucked up name. Ilil, Ili, 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 I-L-L-Y-L-L-E, Ili, Ilil. I am Ilil, Ilil. Some of that confidence trailed away. Ilil, Niall repeated. And I am I-R of the Iftkin. But if she could still hear his voice, his words meant nothing to her now. More of the tears ran down her cheeks from beneath her lowered eyelids, and her lips shaped a small, soft moaning, not unlike the crying that uh, had drawn him there. Water. He needed more water. But to return to the river, the journey was too long to be made in the daylight. Niall shaped a thought for her, hoping the bird might guide him to some forest spring. Uh, in the leaves above came an answer Niall did not understand until he freed himself from Ashla's hold and crawled into the glade about the hut. Ah, the corn flooded from the roof, reached a tree branch well overhead, and moved along it toward a cluster of differently shaped leaves uh, the man had not noticed before. Some form of parasite growing there. <sighs> 
Who cares? The center portion of those drifting stem branches uh, was a large, round growth. Not unlike a bowl fastened levelly in the branch of the supporting tree, Niall climbed, worked his way out, and did indeed find a source of water. Two full cups or more held in that tough fiber basin, and he filled his water bottle from its bounty. Oh, he was in the hut again, sp- Bunging Ashless face, and then a sharp gasp caught him half round to see a figure in the doorway, masked and hooded, but small, small as one of the girl children who'd accompanied Ashla to pick berries days earlier. Oh, the newcomer held a basket before her, and now she backed away, raising that as if to use it as a frail barrier against some unexpected attack. No, no, please, it was a shrill, frightened wail rising into a fast scream that held no words at all. Go, go away! And she flung the basket at him, a water bottle spitting from it uh, to strike against his arm. And then he stooped and caught up a clod of earth and letting it fly without aim. Let Ashla be, let her be. Once more she screamed behind Niall. Ashla herself stirred, a hand caught at his shoulder, as, without apparently seeing him, uh, she dragged herself up on the bed of sacking. Samara, her voice was a hoarse croak. But it, it was a recognition, a sane awareness. The child froze, her eyes frantic. Well, it's all the alopecia totalis probably freaking her out. Frantic where they were framed by the mask holes. Then she screamed again, this time touching a terror that was beyond words. She fell, eh, twisted about and scrambled away on all fours, uh, still screaming. The terror in those cries so great that Niall was kept from any more after her. Samara, Samara, Ashley swayed forward and tried to crawl about and uh, get the little girl. Niall caught her shoulders, drew her back against him in spite of her weak struggles, and now he partially understood Samara's horror. The change in Ashley was almost complete. He's, oh, she's almost bald, and he steadied a woman who is now as much changeling as himself. Ashla had truly become Ilial of the Ifk and a monster in the sight of her own kind. Oh, thank God that chapter's done. Why don't we uh, retire to the smoking room where we can try to remember anything that happened in this story? Well, there we go. I can see you got yourself all settled. Uh, let's recap. Uh, it's been a day since I read the first half, or the first chapter. Uh, he's basically just running around. Ah, damn it. Uh, he's just basically running around. I don't remember anymore. I remember it was, uh, pointless and boring. Um, but he's, oh, that's right. He fell into a pit with some sort of worm creature that was going to eat him. That went on for way too long. Uh, but then luckily for him, uh, his owl friend... Uh, saved him me- te- telepathy uh, but anyways and so then he finally got out of that and of course magical herbs it's basically like uh, everything from the movie Avatar magical magical trees solve everything so instantly his you know wounds are healed and he can get out of there big storm and he hangs out for a while oh the bird's fussy isn't that cute and then uh, after all that uh, then he finally gets an alien girlfriend. It was the one he saw earlier that wanted to be free. She took off the mask cloak thing she's forced to wear based on her religion and culture. And so then, uh, boy, she's dances around, having a great time. Well, now, thanks to being possessed by an alien from, from jewelry, uh, you can, uh, you can do whatever the hell you want. So he's got a girlfriend now, except this damn kid got in the way. All the kids are yelling, leave her alone, because she's a nice kid. So that's the recap. What's good? He's got a girlfriend. Uh, That's nice. At least he didn't, I don't know. He's part alien now. Grow his own vagina or something and have sex with himself. I don't know. But I'm glad uh, they they kept it traditional in this story. He's got a, a regular old girlfriend. So that's great. What sucks? The story sucks. I had to break it into two halves because I just can't sit down and read two chapters in one night because it's just too painful and too boring. And I start to not pay attention to what I'm reading as my mouth is reading it out loud. What do we learn? Uh... Just because you've been uh, inducted into the Science Fiction and Fantasy Hall of Fame and you're also the first woman to be a Gandalf Grandmaster of Fantasy uh, doesn't mean you're actually good at what you do. So uh, with that, thanks for listening, and uh, I'll read two more chapters next week.
Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most, where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. You can tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now, there's there's that. Uh, I, I, are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people. Not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. We can see a backlog of everything I've ever read, including stuff like gestating the curious mind with my lady friend, and also a, a little side project I'm going to be doing with my daughter. Oh, I'm on Instagram, but no one uses that anymore because they all use TikTok. Am I ever going to get on TikTok? No. But if you want to look at my dead Instagram, it's uh, at House Nuzzle. I also have Twitter, which I use the most, which is also conveniently at House Nuzzle. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. Glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com. But don't, uh, don't email if you're a, a nerdlinger or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's got to be one left. 